chapter six of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain bridgie's pudding it was two days before christmas and bridgie o'shaughnessy enveloped herself in a white apron and pensively regarded the contents of the larder in a couple of hours sylvia was expected to arrive and meanwhile mary the cook had been seized with an irresistible craving to visit an invalid mother and had taken herself off for the afternoon leaving the arrangements for dinner in the care of the young mistress and a still younger parlour-maid mary's excuse for requesting leave of absence at so inconvenient a time was somewhat contradictory and involved her mother was failing fast and as it was a custom in the family to die in december it was a daughter's duty to visit her as often as possible the shops were all dressed up for christmas and it was hard that a body should not get a bit of pleasure sometimes and the steak was stewed and could be hotted up at a moment's notice the invalid mother sat up for a couple of hours in the afternoon only so mary must get to the house by three o'clock at the latest and would it matter if she were after eleven in returning as christmas came but once a year sweet bridgie assented warmly to each proposition as it was put before her urged a speedy departure and was rather inclined to think it would be wise to stay at home for the night she could never find it in her heart to deny a pleasure which it was in her power to grant and was gaily confident of managing somehow to prepare a palatable meal for her guest indeed in the ardour of hospitality was rather pleased than otherwise to have a hand in the preparations on the principle of first catch your hair then cook it she looked critically over the contents of the cupboards to find some ingredients which commended themselves to her limited knowledge of the culinary art gelatine had endless possibilities but time was against her and she had the dimmest notions as to the quantity required pastry was always attainable but on the one occasion when she had experimented in this direction jack had taken the nutcrackers to divide his tartlet amidst the cheers of an admiring audience so that there was plainly no fame to be won in this direction milk puddings were too painfully ordinary but a bag of macaroni seemed to offer at once an easy and tasty alternative bridgie felt herself quite capable of boiling the sticks into tenderness and scraping down cheese to add to the milky concoction and a further search discovered a dark yellow lump stowed away in the corner of a cupboard evidently destined for such an end it was wonderfully hard bridgie's fingers ached with the strain of cutting it and she shook her pretty head solemnly over the wastefulness of servants in not using up materials before their freshness was lost she had intended to use the whole of the piece but it took so long to prepare that she stopped half-way and to judge by the mellow brownness of the pudding when she peeped at it in the oven quality had more than made up for quantity sylvia sniffed delicately as she limped over the threshold for the pudding had a strangely powerful smell not exactly savoury perhaps but distinctly fresh and wholesome bridgie bridled in proud consciousness of success while she tucked up her guest on the drawing-room sofa i've been making a pudding for you dear mind you enjoy it mary is out so you are to excuse everything that goes wrong there's a pretty pink cushion to match your dress i never saw that dress before you are wonderfully smart miss sylvia trevor it's for the boys said sylvia laughing i want to make a good impression for i am dreadfully afraid they mayn't like me i know nothing about young men they never penetrate into number six and aunt margaret thinks it is proper to ignore their existence between the ages of six and sixty i thought if i put on the bright dress and my pet chiffon fichu they might not notice how thin my hair is at the top i'll tell them not to notice said bridgie gravely 
she crossed the room and poked the fire with the best brass poker a real live coal fire and no wretched asbestos imitation and knelt on the rug holding out her hands to the blaze and scorching her cheeks with undisturbed complacency the room was mathematically the same in size and shape as the one across the road but oh how different in appearance the one was a museum for the preservation of household gods the other a haven for rest and amusement where comfort was the first consideration and appearance the last bridgie's mending basket stood on the floor jack's pipe peered from behind a chimney-piece ornament and a bulky blotter and well-filled ink-bottle showed that the writing-table was really and seriously meant for use there was a writing-table in miss munn's drawing-room also on which were set out in formal order a papier-mache blotter embellished with a view of york minster by moonlight a brass inkstand which would have been insulted by the touch of ink and a penholder with a cornelian handle which had never known a nib not the most daring of visitors had ever been known to desecrate that shrine when the mistress of the house wished to write a letter she spread a newspaper over the dining-room table and a sheet of blotting paper over that and carefully unlocked the desk which had been a present from cousin mary evans on her sixteenth birthday it is extraordinary what a complete change of air may be obtained sometimes by merely crossing a road or going into the house at the other side of a dividing wall sylvia felt that she might have travelled a hundred miles so entirely different were the conditions by which she found herself surrounded by and by the three brothers arrived in a body letting themselves into the house with a latch-key and talking together in eager undertones in the hall bridgie sat still with a mischievous smile on her lips and presently the drawing-room door was noiselessly opened for half a dozen inches and round the corner appeared a brown head a white forehead and a pair of curious brown eyes sylvia's cheeks were as pink as her dress by the time that those eyes met hers but she was the only person to show signs of embarrassment pat came forward to shake hands with swift cordiality followed in succession by jack and miles and the three big brothers stood beside the sofa looking down on their guest with kindly scrutiny pat's twinkling smile was an augury for future friendship miles's air of angelic sympathy was as good as a tonic while the rapt gaze of jack's fine eyes seemed to imply that never no never had he beheld a girl who so absolutely fulfilled his idea of womanhood it was nothing that the conversation was most ordinary and impersonal concerning itself mostly with such matters as the weather the trains from the city and the christmas traffic the atmosphere was full of subtle flattery and sylvia purred with satisfaction like a sleek little kitten that stretches up its neck to meet an unaccustomed caress nothing is so inspiring as appreciation and she was quite startled by the aptness and brilliancy of her own remarks during the meal which followed jack helped his guest into dinner and once again the pungent odour from the kitchen attracted notice and remark whereat bridgie bridled complacently and when the macaroni was brought to table it did indeed look a most attractive dish to be the work of an amateur so brown was it so mellow a tint with such promise of richness that the general choice settled on it in preference to its more modest neighbour sylvia was naturally helped in advance and the moment of swallowing the first spoonful was momentous and never to be forgotten what had happened she could not tell the room swam round her the tears poured from her eyes she recovered from a paralyzing shock of surprise just in time to see pat's mouth open wide to receive a heaped-up spoonful to hear him roar like a wounded bull and make a dash from the room 
what is the matter cried bridgie in amaze and jack smoothed out the smoking macaroni on his plate and replied cheerfully scalded himself as usual he is so impetuous with his food do him good to have a lesson then he in his turn partook of the dainty and his eyes grew bigger and bigger rounder and rounder the adam's apple worked violently in his throat for one moment it seemed as though he too would fly from the room but presently the struggle was over and he leaned back in his chair pale and dejected his glance meeting sylvia's with melancholy sympathy what is the matter queried bridgie once more and this time there was a touch of testiness in her voice for it was trying to have her efforts treated with such want of appreciation and even if the dish were not all that could be desired consideration for her feelings might have kept her brother silent before a stranger miles you taste it she cried and miles smacked his lips for a thoughtful moment and pronounced sturdily it's very good sylvia groaned involuntarily she could not help it and jack gasped with incredulous dismay staring at his brother as if he could not believe his senses well i always did say that there was nothing in this wide world which would quell your appetite but this beats everything take another spoonful i dare you to do it all right here goes it's a very good mixture said miles complacently swallowing spoonful after spoonful while his vis-a-vis looked on with distended eyes and pat stood transfixed upon the threshold as for bridgie her face brightened with relief and she smiled upon her younger brother with grateful affection that's right miles never mind what they say you are the greatest comfort i have some people are so saucy that there is no pleasing them you and i will enjoy it if no one else will so far she had prudently refrained from experimenting on her own account but now she took up her spoon and there was a breathless silence in the room while she lifted it to her lips it fell back on the plate with a rattle and a clang and an agonized glance roamed round the table from one face to another oh 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 how perfectly awful what can have happened it was so nice when i left it has any one the voice took a tone of indignation have any of you boys been playing tricks on me how could we now if you think of it we've been upstairs or in the drawing-room ever since we came back it's not the will that's wanting but the opportunity cried the boys in chorus but it was not a time for joking and bridgie smote upon the table gong with a determined hand then it must be sarah's fault she's done something to it it is is too bad i took such pains she looked pathetically at the red marks which still lingered on her fingers from that painful cutting and scraping and there was a distinct air of resentment in the voice in which she questioned her assistant a moment later sarah was a round-faced vacant-looking damsel of sixteen summers who had come straight from an industrial home to serve in the o'shaughnessy family she was scrupulously clean admirably willing and so blindly obedient that in the bosom of the family she was known by the title of casa bianca she understood to a nicety how to dust and sweep make beds and turn out a room but the manners and customs of gentle folk had been an unknown science to her before entering her present situation and anything that bridgie chose to do was in her eyes a demonstration of what was right and proper she adored her young mistress and trembled at the new tone of severity in which she was addressed please ma i did nothing at it but something has happened to it sarah that's quite certain think now think carefully what you have done since i left the kitchen i am not angry only anxious to find out what has gone wrong 
it was really most embarrassing the three young gentlemen were watching her with laughing eyes the pretty young lady in the pink dress was staring at her plate and twisting her lips to keep from smiling the missus sat up straight in her chair and looked so grave and masterful like topsy of old sarah tried hard to find something to confess but failed to recall any delinquencies i took it out of the oven when you said and put it on plate i brought it into the room you are quite sure you didn't let anything fall into it by mistake please ma'am there was nothing to fall i had tidied the things away before i touched it i put the macaroni sticks back in the bag and the beeswax along of the turpentine for to-morrow's cleaning all that you didn't use for the pudding the the what gasped bridgie breathlessly but the next moment a great burst of laughter all round the table greeted the solution of the mystery pat capered about the floor jack put his elbows on the table and peered at sylvia with dancing eyes miles undauntedly helped himself to another spoonful and wagged his head as who should say that beeswax or no beeswax he stuck to his favourable verdict on the mixture bridgie's soft gurgling laugh was full of unaffected enjoyment <laughs> did i ever hear the like of that it was a lump of beeswax and i mistook it for cheese it looked just like it so smooth and yellow and hard too hard maybe but i was blaming mary for that not the cheese and thinking myself so good and economical to use it up beeswax and macaroni <laughs> oh i'll never forget it while i live it's a very pretty nose you've got dear but it's not much use to you i'm afraid said jack teasingly did it never occur to you one moment that it was rather highly scented and the scent a little different from the ordinary common or garden cheese and bridgie shook her head in solemn denial never the ghost of a suspicion it shows how easily our senses are deceived when we get a fixed idea in our heads but indeed you were not much cleverer yourselves every man of you had something to say about the smell but not a hint of what it was i thought it was rather spring cleaning me sylvia said mischievously never mind bridgie dear it has been a great success i do feel so much at home more so than i should have done after a dozen formal dinners where everything went right i shall always remember it too and how mr miles declared it was nice don't call him mr please he's only seventeen though he is the champion eater of the world i wonder what exactly is the effect of beeswax taken internally you must tell us all about it miles if you live to the morning how pleased pixie will be murmured bridgie reflectively leaving her hearers to decide whether she referred to miles's problematical disease or the latest culinary disaster and once again sylvia admired the happy faculty of seizing on the humorous side of a misfortune which seemed to be possessed so universally by the o'shaughnessy family End of chapter six Chapter Seven of More About Pixie by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Happy Inspiration. Mrs. Geoffrey Hilliard stood in the long gallery of Knock Castle and drummed wearily on the window pane with a white, heavily ringed hand. It had rained for a whole week without stopping and for the happiest girl in the world as she proclaimed herself to be at least three times a day she came perilously near feeling shedding tears of depression geoffrey was out shooting and the old castle seemed full of ghosts ghosts of the living not of the dead of those dear gay loving teasing happy-go-lucky brothers and sisters who had filled the rooms with echoes of song and laughter 
geoffrey was the dearest of husbands but he had one great insuperable failing he was not irish and one phase of his wife's character was even yet an inexplicable riddle in his eyes why should she consider it monotonous to have her meals served regularly at a stated hour why should she find infinite enjoyment in arranging a festivity in a rush and scramble instead of making her plans with due leisure and decorum why should she wear the latest paris fashions on a day when the thermometer pointed to rain and walk about in the sunshine in an ulster and deerstalker these and many similar questions were as puzzling to him as the fact that she found it absolutely impossible to do a thing twice over in the same way or to master the very rudiments of method geoffrey inherited the business instincts which had made his father successful above their competitors and when he had become temporary owner of knock he had striven hard to introduce order and punctuality into the establishment with more success in the servants hall than in those regions where the mistress reigned supreme esmeralda was a devoted wife who would have gone through fire and water to ensure his happiness she would have shared his poverty with a smiling face and have worked her fingers to the bone on his behalf but she seemed quite incapable of replacing the match-box on his dressing-room mantelpiece when she had borrowed it for her own use or of refraining from taking his nail-scissors downstairs and then forgetting where she had put them geoffrey on his part adored his beautiful wife and would have fought a dozen dragons on her behalf but when he groped in the dark for his matches and knocked his pet ornaments off the chimney-piece and barked his knee against a chair and tried vainly to get out of the room through a blank wall well he was only a man after all and he was not precisely lamb-like in temper some such incident had happened this afternoon when the husband had made a complaining remark and the wife had poured oil on the troubled waters by murmured allusions to people who were not really men but finicky old maids geoffrey had stalked majestically from the room leaving esmeralda to reflect sadly how very unsatisfactory it was to quarrel when your adversary was dignified and english with either of her three brothers such an introduction would have meant an enjoyable and lengthy wrangle even st bridget could snap on occasion while pixie was capable of screaming it is not it is not until her breath failed for pure love of contradiction esmeralda yawned and wondered what in the world she could do to while away the long afternoon as the wife of a millionaire with a professional cook in the kitchen who tolerated her mistress's incursions at stated hours only with a wardrobe full of new clothes and a french maid to sew up every hole almost before it made an appearance with a gardener who did not like interference and a patriarchal butler who said allow me madam if she dared to lift a hand for herself life was not really half so amusing as in the dear old days when she could make potato cakes for tea re-trim old dresses with bridgie as model and sit perched on one of the empty stages in the conservatory while dennis confided his latest love experiences and the gossip of the countryside esmeralda had longed for riches all her life and for the most part found the experience to her taste but there were occasions when she felt fettered by the golden chains when bridgie wrote of her experiences in that funny cramped little house of her various devices for making sixpence to duty for a shilling of excursions about london when she rode with the boys on the tops of omnibuses and dined luxuriously at an a b c it was not pity but envy which filled esmeralda's bosom as she drove in state behind coachman and footman to pay dull proper calls on the county magnates 
it was cold and dark in the gallery this december afternoon so she went downstairs into the room which had been dedicated to lessons when miss minnett the governess tried to instill knowledge into half a dozen ignorant heads it was now metamorphosed into a luxuriant little boudoir with pots of hothouse plants banked on the table a couch piled with silken cushions taking the place of the old horsehair sofa a charming grate all glowing copper and soft green tiles and beside it a deep armchair and a pile of books to while away an idle hour esmeralda yawned and flicked over the pages of the topmost of the pile looked at the beginning to see if it promised excitement peeped at the last sentence of all to make sure there was no heart-breaking separation finally sank down into the chair and settled herself to read there was something wanting for perfect enjoyment however for in the old days she and bridgie had agreed that the charms of an interesting book could only be thoroughly appreciated to an accompaniment of crisp sweet apples esmeralda o'shaughnessy had been wont to climb up into the loft and bring down as many rosy baldwins as she could carry in the crown of her cap but mrs geoffrey hilliard crept down her own passages like a thief listened breathlessly at the pantry door to make sure that montgomery was absent then abstracted an apple from each of the two pyramids of fruit already prepared for dinner and flew back to her room aghast at her own temerity the presence of the apples seemed to bring back other schoolgirl impulses for instead of seating herself in dignified grown-up fashion she stretched herself on the rug before the fire her back supported against the chair her head drooping ever nearer and nearer the cushions as warmth and quiet wrought their usual work she slept and dreamt and awoke with a start to hear a voice observing tea is served madam and to see montgomery the immaculate standing over her with an unmoved expression as if in the many noble families in which he had served it was an invariable custom to find his mistress fast asleep on the floor with a half-gnawed apple in her hand esmeralda crawled to her feet trying vainly to look dignified but she had no appetite for muffins she felt like a child who's been found out and blushed at the thoughts of her embarrassment that evening when the fruit pyramid was handed for her selection tea did not taste half so nice out of the queen anne silver as when it had been poured from the old brown pot which had to be refilled so many times to satisfy clamorous appetites and the longing for companionship made her hurry through the meal and run upstairs to a wide room overlooking the park with the opening of the door came that sweet flannelly soapy violet powdery smell which is associated with a well-kept nursery and there on the rocking-chair sat mistress nurse with a bundle of embroidery on her knee which purported to be o'shaughnessy geoffrey the heir of the hilliards oh i am so glad you have come ma'am i did so want you to see him he has been so pert this afternoon i don't know what to do with him he is so pert i never saw such a forward child for his age esmeralda's face softened to a beautiful tenderness as she turned down the shetland shawl and looked at her little son the pert child had a fat white face with vacant eyes a button of a nose and an expression of preternatural solemnity his head waggled helplessly from side to side as his nurse held him out at arm's length and stared fixedly into space regardless of his mother's blandishments there now isn't he pert repeated the triumphant nurse you know your mammy my precious yes you do the cleverest little sing that ever was seen he will begin to talk ma'am before he is many months old i'm sure he will i was speaking to him just now and he tried so hard to copy me i said goo and he said coo oh you would have loved to hear him he is a prince of babies he is a beautiful darling pet esmeralda beamed with maternal pride he is clever she cried 
fancy talking a three months old i must write and tell bridgie and he looks so intelligent too doesn't he nurse so wise and serious he stares at the fire as if he knew all about it i believe his hair has grown since yesterday i do indeed he has beautiful hair so fine it's going to curl too declared the optimistic nurse holding the child's head against the light when the faintest of downs could be dimly discerned across the line of the horizon he will smile in a moment if you go on talking to him ma'am perhaps he would like to sit down and take him for a bit yes esmeralda was only too willing for it was only by act of grace and when mistress nurse felt inclined for a gossip in the servants hall that she was allowed to nurse her own baby she took the dear little soft bundle in her arms and rocked gently to and fro studying the little face and dreaming mother dreams of the days to come if god spared him the tiny form would grow strong the vacant face would become bright and alert with life the might of a hand would be bigger than her own a man's hand with a man's work as its inheritance there was something awful in the thought and in her own responsibility towards his future esmeralda never felt so serious so prayerful so little satisfied with herself as when she sat alone with her baby in her arms she knew nothing about children very little poor girl of the wise training of father and mother but the very consciousness of her own defects added earnestness to the resolve to bring up this child to be wise and strong and noble a power for good in the world that was her resolve renewed afresh from day to day and after the resolve followed the relentless conviction that the change must be wrought in herself before she would have power to teach another it would need a noble mother to train a noble son a mother who was mistress over her own tongue to teach the lessons of self-control a mother who had fought her own giants of vanity and self-seeking before she could hand on the sword esmeralda trembled and shrank weakly from the conflict but the baby turned its wondering eyes upon her and straightway she was strong again my son she murmured tenderly my little son we shall love one another oh how we shall love one another you and i the beautiful dark head bent low over the shapeless little bundle and the croon of a cradle song accompanied the regular rocking of the chair it was the most peaceful and charming of pictures and the husband and father stood noiselessly on the threshold almost unwilling to speak and destroy the effect all the afternoon he had been regretting his hasty words and reproaching himself for want of forbearance towards his impetuous girl wife it was unreasonable to expect the habit of a lifetime to be outlived in a few short months and at this season there were especial reasons for judging her tenderly poor darling she had suffered a bitter disappointment bridgie and the boys had found it impossible to spend christmas at knock and although joan had not confessed as much in words the slackness of her preparations showed that she had lost all zest in the season she had had a dull time of it since the birth of the boy and it was only natural that she should long for her own people especially those two dear sisters whose names were so constantly on her lips if it were only possible to indulge her to hit upon some plan by which christmas could be made all she could desire geoffrey knitted his brows in thought then suddenly came the inspiration and with it an exclamation of satisfaction which brought esmeralda's eyes upon him she smiled softly and held up her face to receive his kiss such a different face from the one which she had seen two hours before with its curling lips and flushed contemptuous smile in its sweetness and subdued tenderness it was a type of the youthful madonna and geoffrey's own expression softened in sympathy well my dearie nursing your boy esmeralda turned back the shawl once more 
and held up the child for his father's inspection there isn't he splendid nurse is quite excited about him this afternoon she says it is wonderful how he gets on he has been so pert as she calls it that she hardly knew how to manage him hmm the young father regarded the little face with amused speculative eyes pert does not commend itself to me as precisely the best word which could be found solemn little beggar i call him he seems quite oppressed by the wickedness of the world i say that's a rather peculiar mouth isn't it something funny about the upper lip it's exactly like yours the image of it said esmeralda firmly you can't judge because naturally you can't see yourself but it really is look at that old picture when you were two years old geoffrey stroked his moustache to one side and regarded himself critically in the mirror oh well there's hope for him yet he pronounced complacently i suppose babies are all ugly in the beginning but considering his parentage he ought to come out of it all right by and by how long do you suppose it will be before he gets his hair and begins to be intelligible he has hair now and he is beginning to speak he said coo this afternoon quite distinctly it's horrid of you jeff to call him ugly every one says he is a beautiful boy and the image of you much more chance of being beautiful if he were like you darling spoke did he well i take your word for it but it's rather a stretch of imagination he is a jolly little chap anyway and i'm very proud of him here is nurse coming to take possession hand him over and come along with me i have something to tell you something nice i hope i want a distraction said esmeralda wistfully she slid her hand through her husband's arm as they walked down the corridor and peered up in his face somebody was rather vicious this afternoon i'm sorry you put me in a temper it's stupid to quarrel when we are so fond of one another you'll never do it again will you never never it was all my fault and i apologize abjectly to your temper for taking liberties with it i ought to know by this time that it's in delicate health never mind i've planned a delightful program for you what would you like best for a christmas present if you had the choice he was all radiant with smiles but as Meralda sighed and a faraway expression came into her beautiful gray eyes i'd like oh what's the use of speaking of it jeff they can't come and that's all about it i haven't thought of any present i don't seem to care about anything else whisper cried geoffrey triumphantly whisper he bent his head and esmeralda put her ear to his lips her face alight with expectation oh she cried rapturously and again oh and oh in ever ascending tones of delight do you mean it jeff really really it's like a fairy tale so perfectly lovely and charming i shan't sleep a wink i know i shan't geoffrey you darling i do love you for thinking of it and in an ecstasy of delight she threw her arms round his neck and kissed him rapturously any letters for the post madam asked an even voice from the end of the corridor and the husband wrenched himself free while the wife stared after the departing figure with gloomy eyes he saw me kiss you the only marvel is he didn't offer to do it for me the strain of behaving properly before that man will be the death of me geoffrey hilliard end of chapter seven Chapter Eight of More About Pixie by Mrs. George D. Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Surprise Visit. The next two days, Jack came home early from the city, where a remarkable cessation of work had happened simultaneously with the arrival of Miss Sylvia Trevor at Number Three Rutland Road. 
bridgie trotted about the house preparing for the festival on thursday and sylvia lay idly upon the couch with nothing better to do than to listen sympathize and admire it was easy to listen for in truth jack gave her no opportunity to do anything else it was impossible to resist admiring for he made a handsome figure with his broad muscular shoulders graceful carriage and clean-shaven face it had seemed at first sight as if sympathy were not required but master jack invented a fresh crop of imaginary woes every time that he met a pretty girl for the express purpose of receiving consolation sylvia beheld him in an exile from home and country toiling at an uncongenial task for the maintenance of his orphaned brothers and sisters and was vaguely given to understand that since meeting her his poverty had become an even more painful barrier to his hopes he confided in her details of business which she understood as well as a buried language and asked her advice on knotty points in such a flattering manner that she forgot to notice that he never paused for a reply and when at last he reluctantly rose to leave the room he sighed profoundly and in a voice touched with emotion declared that she had helped him as he had never before been helped i cannot thank you enough for your sympathy and counsel but i shall never forget what you have said to me to-day it will help me through many a dark hour he declared and sylvia blushed and gasped and lay back on her cushions all tremulous with excitement it was her first experience of the art of flirtation and she was pleased and flattered as it was natural for a girl to be but she was a sensible little woman despite her hasty speeches and her vanity was not big enough to cloud either her judgment or remarkably accurate memory she carefully recalled to mind the late conversation and found that her own share therein had been limited to monosyllabic assents and denials an occasional really and three or four exclamations of how sad these then were the vaunted sympathy and counsel these the eloquent words which mr jack had vowed to treasure in deathless remembrance and which were to strengthen him in hours of trial sylvia blushed once more from mortification this time and registered a vow to adopt a new tone with this disciple of the blarney stone and put an end forthwith to sentimental confidences she was still looking hot and flurried when bridgie came into the room to prepare for tea and to rest after the day's labours you look tired dear she said anxiously i hope jack has not been talking too much he just dotes upon romancing when he can get a listener and i don't like to interrupt when i knew he had come home especially to see you jack falls in love with every fresh girl he meets and they mostly fall in love with him too he has such lovely humbugging eyes do they indeed he shan't humbug me that's one thing certain was sylvia's mental comment aloud she assented cordially most handsome eyes i call him unusually good-looking for a man and he has amused me very much but i am more than ready for tea and a little of your society there's the clatter of the cups welcome sound it's music in my ears how i used to long for it when i was ill i'll draw the curtains and make the room look cosy that is one good thing about a tiny house you can keep it warm we were frozen in the great draughty barns of rooms at knock and pixie used to look so quaint with her feet in snow boots and her hands in a muff and her little nose as red as a cherry it was so cold that it kept her awake at nights until the major brought an elegant little egg cosy at a bazaar in dublin and she slept in it regularly through the frost we used to go to kiss her last thing every night every man jack of us for the pleasure of seeing her lying there so peaceful with the cosy perched over her nose muffins dear i didn't make them so you may eat them with an easy mind jack came downstairs at the summons of the tea-bell looking in languishing fashion at his comforter as he entered the room when to his surprise back came an answering glance as it were parodying his own 
the sentimental attitude belied by twinkling eyes and mischievous lips the blush and tremor of an hour ago were conspicuous by their absence and the change was by no means appreciated by the startled onlooker in vain he tried to return to the old footing accompanying the simplest remark with a hint of secret understanding and waiting upon her with a deference which seemed humbly to inquire the reason of the change sylvia bluntly inquired what is it in reply to his appealing looks kept him trotting to and from the tea-table and said how clumsy you are when his fingers touched her own over the cake-basket even jack o'shaughnessy found it impossible to continue flirting under these conditions and devoted himself to the consumption of muffins with a crestfallen air while bridgie regarded him with fond commiseration from behind the tea-tray it was at this opportune moment that the clatter of wheels stopped at the door and the peal of the bell rang through the house sarah went to the door and there was a movement and bustle in the hall at the sound of which bridgie nodded complacently the parcel's delivery van i thought something must be coming have you any change jack i've nothing smaller than sixpence and the man will want a christmas box a few coppers perhaps oh give the poor beggar half a crown don't insult him with coppers said jack in his lordly way pulling a handful of silver from his pocket and selecting the largest coin of the number i'll take it to him myself you might give him some tea if there is any left it is perishingly cold outside he stepped towards the door but before he reached it it was opened from without a tall figure precipitated itself into the room and with two separate cries of rapture the sisters flew to meet each other and stood with locked arms kissing laughing and questioning with incredulous delight esmeralda darling is it really you you are not a dream dear are you i can't believe it's true it was jeff's doing he saw i was fretting for you and suggested that we should come to town and stay over the new year at an hotel there was not time to get the house ready a whole week bridgie won't we talk there are such oceans of things to tell you baby is beginning to speak the precious mite bridgie disentangled one hand and held it towards her brother-in-law in beaming welcome i always did say you were a broth of a boy geoffrey but you have eclipsed yourself this time i am so happy i don't know how to bear it now christmas will be something like christmas and she smiled encouragingly into sylvia's embarrassed face we have a visitor staying with us to make things still more festive my new friend miss sylvia trevor who is recovering from a long illness esmeralda wheeled round to face the sofa and stared at the stranger with haughty scrutiny her flowing skirts seemed to fill the little room her cloak was thrown back showing a glimpse of costly sable lining her imperious beauty made her appear older than the gentle bridgie a hundred times more formidable the formal bend of the head brought with it an acute sense of discomfiture to the recipient for the first time since crossing that hospitable threshold she realized that she was a solitary unit a stranger sat down in the midst of an affectionate family party and if it had not been for the crippling foot she would have rushed away to the haven of the room upstairs as it was however she was condemned to lie still and return esmeralda's commonplaces with what grace she might i am pleased to see you said esmeralda's tongue what a nuisance you are said the flash of the cold grey eyes such a pleasure for bridgie to have a friend but now that i have arrived you are not wanted any longer and are terribly in my way one set of phrases were as intelligible as the other to the sensitive invalid and if esmeralda's anticipations were dashed by her presence she herself abandoned all prospect of enjoyment and only longed to be able to return home forthwith bridgie would not need her companionship any longer she could be but a restraint and killjoy in the conferences of newly united sisters she stared dismally at the floor 
then looked up to see jack carrying the tea-table bodily across the room and setting it down by her couch sarah had brought in fresh tea and cakes for the refreshment of the travellers and he motioned slightly towards his sisters saying in an undertone bridgie will be incoherent for an hour will you come to the rescue if we don't look after the tea no one else will he smiled at her as he spoke not sentimentally this time but with a straightforward kindliness which showed that he had understood and sympathized with her embarrassment occupation for hand and mind was the most tactful comfort which he could have administered and bridgie's eager oh thank you dear how good of you showed that she was indeed thankful to be relieved of every duty but that of talking to her sister and watching her with adoring eyes sylvia's post was no sinecure for every one started tea-drinking afresh to encourage the travellers and amidst the babble of voices jack's sotto voce explanations made the conversation intelligible and took away the feeling of being left out in the cold at a touch of real sympathy the false sentiment had disappeared and her heart warmed towards the young fellow for his kindly concern for her comfort it was a bond of union also to remember that he himself was apt to resent the incursions of this domineering young matron and she noted with delight that while bridgie was apparently delighted to be trampled under foot he was ready and able to hold his own we came over in a rush and arrived only two hours ago i'm a disreputable object said esmeralda glancing complacently over her sweeping skirts and arranging the immaculate frills at her throat geoffrey was in such a hurry to get off that he gave me no time to make myself decent she had only an hour poor thing not a moment longer she sent me flying off to look for trains and a whistle for a hansom and then kept me kicking my heels while she prinked before the glass putting on her best dress and the newest hat to impress you with her magnificence she is disappointed that you have not noticed them yet that's why she pretends to be humble explained geoffrey in self-defence whereas his wife grimaced at him in a manner singularly undignified and eloquent then she glanced hastily across the room at sylvia looking so girlish so abashed at having been discovered in her schemes that sylvia laughed involuntarily and forgot the old offence husbands are such blighting creatures they are always telling the truth upon you sighed esmeralda sadly i intend to bring up bunting to agree with all i say and then there will be some chance of making an impression he is left at home for he is too young to miss us and it was bad weather for moving a nursery now about to-morrow we have arranged for you to spend the day with us and have lunch and dinner in our private room the servants can eat up your turkey or it can wait until the next day you must come to us directly after church what train will you be able to catch bridgie nodded her brows and looked embarrassed and distressed the invitation could not of course be accepted and it was thoughtless of esmeralda to have given it under existing circumstances had not sylvia been introduced as a convalescent and did not her position on the couch prove that she was unable for a journey to town it would make the poor dear so uncomfortable if she were cited as the obstacle yet what other excuse could be made esmeralda had travelled all the way from knock for the pleasure of entertaining her brothers and sisters and would not be lightly turned from her plans bridgie looked across the room and met jack's eyes turned upon her with a flash of indignation in their clear depths well bridgie you can do as you like but i give you full notice that i stay at home he said firmly i have never yet eaten my christmas dinner in an hotel and i never shall so long as i have a roof of my own to cover me choose between esmeralda and me i am the head of the family and it is my privilege to play host on such occasions but if the house is too small if we are not grand enough for mrs hilliard jack cried esmeralda sharply she pushed her cup on one side and springing across the room to her brother's side laid her hands on his shoulders and shook him vigorously to and fro 
come down this minute from that high horse i won't be snubbed when i've come all the way over from ireland to see you i thought you would like it dear because you enjoyed dining with us so much before and we should have been quite private in our own room but i don't mind where we are so long as we are together we will come and dine with you if you will ask us i would far rather have stayed here altogether if you could have put us up we could stow you away but we can't manage the retinue miss trevor occupies the northwest tudor corridor and there is only pixie's little den at liberty said jack laughing and recovering his complacency with wonderful quickness the servants hall accommodation is also limited and your maid and valet might not appreciate our menage we had a very stylish pudding the other night you might give esmeralda the recipe bridgie esmeralda listened to the history of the beeswax and macaroni with a joy tempered by regret we never have anything so nice as that she sighed never a bit of excitement as to how things will turn out do you remember the day when old suki mixed the lettuce with furniture cream instead of salad dressing and major denny was so polite with a crust of bread under one end of his plate to let it drain down to the bottom while he ate his meat high and dry at the top twas bad luck that none of us fancied lettuce that day but kept pressing him to a second helping well we will come here to-morrow morning then don't stay away from church for truthfully i would rather you were out when we arrived i have some rather large christmas presents which must be smuggled in unobserved i have some um, preparations to make to-night so we can't stay very long half an hour later husband and wife took their departure and after seeing them off jack came back into the drawing-room and stood by sylvia's couch esmeralda invariably speaks before she thinks he said apologetically there's a lot of pretense about her but you will be astonished to find out what a good sort she is when you know her better sylvia smiled with a whimsical twist of the lips she thought that that prediction might apply to more than one member of the o'shaughnessy family and cherished a pleasant conviction that jack's outburst of indignation had been more on her account than his own he was not the type of man to stand on his dignity and his quick glance into her face as esmeralda gave her invitation had been eloquent of understanding his protest had saved her from a most distasteful position and once again she felt a debt of gratitude towards him End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of More About Pixie by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christmas Presents. Christmas morning was heralded by the luxury of a late breakfast when no one need hurry off to town, and even Miles could satisfy the demands of appetite without casting a thought to the timetable porridge bacon eggs and sausages laid the foundation of his meal before he tackled marmalade strawberry jam fresh oranges and honey accompanied by numerous draughts of tea and coffee and finally by a cup filled with the united drainings of both pots which he drank with obvious relish if it had been mary pat who was so difficult to appease there would have been no cause for astonishment but miles's rapt eyes and ethereal expression seemed to bespeak no stronger diet than moonbeams and mountain dew and to hear him accompany his last mouthful with an eager when's lunch was a distinct shock to the visitor jack too had sustained a relapse into sentiment and was only awaiting opportunity to wax melancholy and confidential with a word of encouragement he would have stayed away from church to bear her company but sylvia was provokingly obtuse and he went off looking unutterable reproaches with his humbugging eyes left to herself sylvia hobbled to the piano and sang christmas hymns in a weak little voice which wavered suspiciously towards the close christmas is the day of all others when families are united 
and it seemed hard that when she possessed just one beloved relation he should be away off at the other end of the world the strange house the unusual silence and her own inability to move about added to the feeling of depression and her thoughts turned toward aunt margaret with unusual yearning the old lady was at times a sore trial to her niece's patience but at least they had a claim on each other's affection she was the dear father's sister and her own legal guardian during his absence sylvia wondered how the two ladies would pass their day church in the morning as a matter of course early dinner and reminiscences of the brougham and peach houses arrival of the postman with cards renewed reminiscences and family histories of the various senders one armchair at each side of the fire two white caps nodding sleepily forward two pairs of cashmere boots reposing on footstools arrival of tea and exchange of recipes and household experiences letters of thanks to valued friends for seasonable gifts supper of cold turkey and cocoa with anecdotal references to christmases of long ago mutual exchange of compliments bed nightcaps and sleeping socks oh dear me it all seemed very flat to one and twenty and why should one girl have health and beauty and brothers and sisters and an adoring young husband into the bargain and another be a solitary unit with no one to cosset her and help her to bear her manifold infirmities sylvia's tears were still rather near the surface and she mopped her eyes with her handkerchief and mopped them again and then carefully dried them on a dry place and craned forward to look in the glass and see if they looked very red and tell-tale the bleared reflection had a wonderfully calming effect and she limped to her couch and read persistently to distract her thoughts until the peal of the bell announced the hilliard's arrival from her corner she could not see the doorway but judging from the sounds of coming and going of dragging heavy weights of scurrying along the passage of whispered colloquies and sudden explosions of laughter it was evident that some great mystery was in the air then the cab drove away the dining-room door closed with a bang she heard the furniture being dragged to and fro and wondered how long it would be before the drawing-room was raided in its turn for a quarter of an hour the conspirators remained shut up together then esmeralda came sailing into the room all smiles and amiability a happy christmas to you miss trevor excuse me for not coming in before but i am so anxious to arrange my presents before the others come home from church i want the easel from that corner and i want you to promise faithfully that you won't come into the dining-room before you are allowed i can't walk so far without help you are quite safe so far as i am concerned said sylvia regretfully and esmeralda looked at her with quick scrutiny so bad as that i didn't know is that why you've been crying no oh no i'm used to that now i felt a little lonely that's all i wanted my father the beautiful face changed suddenly the lips tightened the eyes grew large and strained there was a ring of pain in the clear voice is he dead no no only so far away at the other end of the world in ceylon you will see him again said esmeralda shortly she looked at the portrait of a handsome reckless face which hung on the wall above the sofa and drew a fluttering sigh that was my father it is nearly two years since he had his accident and i thought i could never be happy again if i could write to him if i could get his letters and think that some day it might be in twenty years to come he would be back among us again i should feel as if there was nothing else to wish for she sat down suddenly by the couch with an air of having forgotten all about the errand which had brought her into the room clasped her hands round her knee 
and began a series of disconnected childish memories while sylvia gazed spellbound at the beautiful dreamy face and wondered how she could ever have thought it cold and unfeeling we were always such chums from the time that i was a mite in pinafores i remember his first explaining to me what happened when people died how their bodies were put into the grave while their souls went straight to heaven but i didn't understand what a soul was and i was frightened and cried out well i won't go one step without my body i used to play tricks on him and he would catch me up and carry me into his room and say will you rather be poisoned or buried alive and i would prefer the poisoning because it was chocolates out of the corner cupboard he used to wake me in the mornings coming battering at my door and singing come awake thee awake thee my merry swiss lass and when we were learning french fables from miss minnett we used to take arms bridgie and i and walk up and down before him reciting du compagnon presse d'argent it didn't make any difference whether he had the money or not he always gave it to us one day we were going for a picnic and he walked on with the men leaving me to drive after them in the cart with the provisions there was only one thing he told me to remember and that was just what i forgot his camera to take a special view which he'd wanted for an age four miles from home it jumped into my mind and i sat in misery the rest of the way the major laughed when i told him and sympathized with me for my upset you'll forget your own head next and it will be a pity he said for it's a very pretty one i hated to vex him just because he was so sweet about it no one ever understood me as well as the major and when i was in a tantrum he would say think it over till to-morrow my girl if you are of the same mind then we will discuss it together and of course i never did think the same two days running when he was ill he used to lie looking at me and his face was quite different from that in the picture so sad and wistful i've not done much in the way of training you my girl he would say but i've loved you a great deal maybe that will do as well you are not one to stand a bridle he loved to have me with him to the last he would stretch out his hand her voice quivered and stopped and sylvia sat with lowered eyes murmuring incoherent condolences esmeralda's love for her dead father was very sweet and touching but to the more reserved nature it seemed an extraordinary thing that she could speak so openly to a stranger and in the twinkling of an eye change her mood from gay to grave the hands of the clock were approaching the hour when the rest of the family might be expected to return from church yet there she sat dreaming over the past and apparently absolutely forgetful of the demands of the present sylvia dare not risk a reminder which would seem in the last degree unfeeling but presently the door opened and geoffrey hilliard appeared on the threshold looking round with anxious inquiry good morning miss trevor the compliments of the season then he looked at his wife all incredulous and aghast my dear girl what are you about do you know that at any moment bridgie may be here i thought you had come for the easel esmeralda leaped to her feet with a cry of dismay hurry hurry she cried oh what are you waiting for carry it for me be quick be quick and off she rushed with a swirl of flounces a rustle of silk a wild waving of arms while her husband chuckled with amusement and confided in sylvia that's the usual programme first keeps me waiting for hours then upbraids me for being slow keep bridgie occupied if she comes in too soon please miss trevor this little surprise needs a good deal of preparation what could it be sylvia grew quite excited as once more peals of laughter echoed from the dining-room esmeralda was evidently sparing no pains to display her presence to the best advantage 
and lucky girl no want of money had hampered her choice of what would be appropriate and welcome i'm glad i gave bridgie my minute offering this morning so that it won't be shamed by contrast i shall be out of this distribution so it doesn't matter but i do hope they will ask me to go in said sylvia to herself i hated esmeralda last night but i rather love her this morning she is like the little girl in the rhyme when she is nice she is very very nice but when she is bad she is horrid after all the mysterious preparations were completed before the return of the church party for the service had been unusually lengthy and esmeralda was champing with impatience before the latchkey clicked in the lock there was great kissing and hugging beneath the mistletoe and bridgie was sent flying upstairs to take off her wraps in preparation for the great exhibition i have laid out our presents in the dining-room and they take up all the table so there will be no dinner until they are distributed i've lighted the lamp dear to make it look more festive hope you don't mind it was just the least thought in the world gloomy in that back room this morning anything you like dear anything you like cried bridgie the docile then she looked at sylvia and beamed with satisfaction as geoffrey offered his arm to support the invalid's halting footsteps they led the way together and she seated herself in state in an armchair while the brothers and sisters crowded in at the doorway exclaiming volubly at the sight which met their eyes the table had been pushed lengthways against the window the crimson curtains making an effective background to its heaped-up treasures the lamp stood at the farther end of the room casting a subdued rosy light on the eager faces it was not exactly a cheery illumination but it was certainly becoming and lent an air of mystery to the everyday surroundings a new lampshade how lovely pink silk and roses wouldn't it make a sweet garden hat exclaimed bridgie rapturously is that my present joan how did you know i wanted a shade that's a present for the house yours is over there in that round box geoffrey will hand it to you there's a present for everybody and one for you all together you'll see that last at that every eye turned curiously at the curtained picture frame which stood artfully supported by boxes at the place of honour at the farther end of the table evidently this was the grand climax of the entertainment but meantime there were half a dozen excitements in store all calling for rapturous acknowledgments bridgie's round box was found to contain a muff of real russian sable on receiving which to use her own expressive phrase she nearly swooned with delight she sat purring over it and rubbing it fondly against her cheeks while dandy jack was presented with a dressing-case fitted with silver and ivory pat with a handsome camera and miles with a bicycle deftly wheeled from behind the curtains even the servants had been remembered for there was a bulky parcel addressed to each name and sylvia grew red with mingled pleasure and embarrassment as a casket of french bonbons was deposited on her knee it was a delightful scene and not the least delightful part of it was the enjoyment of the young couple themselves and their whole-hearted participation in the pleasure of the recipients it is the custom of most donors to depreciate their gifts but that was not esmeralda's way not a bit of it she was a capital showwoman and if by chance any detail of perfection passed unnoticed she pointed it out forthwith and dilated at length upon its virtues jack turned over the silver-topped bottles and peeped at his reflection in the mirror miles tingled his bicycle bell and balanced himself on the saddle sylvia handed round bonbons and surreptitiously fumbled to discover how many rows the box contained and pat demanded immediate orders for family groups it took some little time to restore order but geoffrey stood patiently waiting until he could make himself heard and his hand stretched out to uncover the curtained frame 
now for the general present with best wishes to the family circle from joan and myself are you ready very well then here you are one two three with the last word he whisked off the cloth and a gasp sounded through the room followed by a silence more eloquent than words sylvia stared with widened eyes at the picture of a girl's head strangely like and yet unlike that precious photograph which bridgie had exhibited with so much pride it was pixie that was quite evident but an older bigger wonderfully smartened edition of the elf-like child the dark locks were rolled back in pompadour fashion over a high cushion the plate turned up in a queue fastened at the nape of the neck by an enormous outstanding bow the cheeks were fuller in outline and the disproportion between nose and mouth less marked she was by no means pretty yet there was a charm about the quaint little face which made the onlooker smile involuntarily and feel a sudden outgoing of affection pixie gasped bridgie in a breathless whisper she rested her cheek against the muff and stared before her with rapt grey eyes pixie's portrait oh esmeralda what a lovely thought you had it taken for us you sent to paris for it yes 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 cried esmeralda gleefully i knew it would please you more than anything else to have her with us do you like it do you think it's good is it quite like her it's like yes but not quite lifelike does she really do her hair like that i can't imagine pixie looking so neat she looks grave too graver than she ever looked except when she was up to mischief i hope she is not fretting poor child oh it makes me long for her more than ever i could look at it all day long jack stroked his chin and smiled contentedly that's what i call something like a present it's a rattling good portrait of the piccaninny judiciously flattered as portraits ought to be we can't see it though in this light let me put the lamp a little nearer or take off the shade esmeralda however was standing next the lamp and refused to move aside we arranged it to give the best light so it's no use trying to improve it the best view is from over there by the door she said in her masterful fashion which would brook no contradiction one can never see a picture to the best advantage by lamplight but you must make allowances for that do you think it is well done it is by a very good master rather starry about the eyes said pat critically laid on the red rather too thickly about the cheeks objected miles bridgie put down her muff and went stooping across the room to get a nearer view is it oil or water-colour i seem to know the frame oh it is like her esmeralda oh so like pixie pixie my little pixie bridgie cried an answering voice the picture swayed rocked forward and fell on its face on the table a little figure stood squeezed in between the table and the window it was no picture but a reality pixie herself stood among them in warm living flesh and blood End of chapter 9chapter ten of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain pixie's reminiscences it is wonderful what money can do in conjunction with generous impulse and ingenious brain esmeralda hung on to bridgie's arm relating in breathless accounts how being herself unable to go abroad until after the new year the happy inspiration had occurred to geoffrey of dispatching the french maid to her native city to bring back the dear living christmas present which now stood before them 
how the travellers had arrived on the previous evening afire with delight at their own share in the conspiracy how she herself had conceived the idea of presenting pixie in the form of a portrait and had brought the frame from home and tacked across it a piece of black gauze to heighten the picture-like effect and i put the lamp as far away from it as possible and covered it over so that she might not have to keep still too long oh if you could only have seen yourselves staring at her and taking it all in grim earnest i never never enjoyed anything so much in my days is it oil colours i am or water i'm flattered ain't i as a portrait ought to be you couldn't imagine i could be so neat cried pixie tauntingly as she pirouetted to and fro on the top of the table to which she had lightly sprung at the first moment of discovery she looked like a big french doll as she swung from side to side her hands outheld her shoulders raised her tiny feet twinkling to and fro her pink frock was marvellously smart the flounces stood out in jaunty fashion around the ankles the sash encircled a tiny waist and the brothers and sisters stood looking on joy incredulity amaze written on their faces bridgie's arms kept stretching out and falling back to her side with automatic regularity and still the little figure pranced and gesticulated and blew kisses to right and left at one moment a merry irish vagabond at the next a french marionette all smirks and bows and shrugging shoulders we got the better of you that time i'm thinking oh la la how it was droll to hear you all making your pleasantries upon me while i kept still so still i have never been so still but when i am up to mischief if ye could have seen under the table i was shaking like a jelly but esmeralda said i'll pack ye back as quick as ye came if ye spoil it on me after all me trouble figure it to yourselves i was sitting so triste by myself in the salon thinking of you all at home and the fun ye'd have without me and the slices of plum pudding fried up the next day the way i like them best and never a bite to come my way when beheld i the door opened and there enters to me marie all smiles and complacence everything is altered she bears a letter from madame hilliard i must pack my box and say my farewells and be ready to start by train the next day fortunately all is ready therese has already prepared for my return there was nothing to do but lay the things in the box and drive away and what did therese say to it all how did she and pere like parting from you in such a hurry they wept said pixie tragically her shoulders approached her ears in eloquent gesture but how they wept i also wept to see them weep and marie wept to leave her dear paris she paused and the solemn expression gave place to a broad smile of enjoyment there wasn't a dry rag between the four of us and pere took snuff to console himself and that started him crying harder than ever i was so flurried i couldn't tell which was the topmost joy or sorrow until we had ham and eggs for breakfast this morning and i felt i was at home it's an awful thing to live in a country where there's never a bite of solid food to cheer your spirits in the morning many's the time me heart would bleed thinking of miles if he'd been there are you glad to see me boys now you know that i'm real and there was no doubt about that when at last the little sister condescended to step down from her perch she was passed from one to another in a series of bear-like hugs from which she emerged flushed and complacent to step briskly toward sylvia and kiss her effusively upon the cheek how do you do me dear and how's your illness i've heard so much about it that i expected to see you worse you look too pretty to be an invalid hear hear muttered jack softly sylvia blushed and gripped the little hand which lay so confidingly in her own thank you very much i'm getting better but i don't feel at all pretty i'm lame 
and have to limp about wherever i go and my hair is tumbling out i have the greatest difficulty to make it look respectable i shall be bald soon pixie craned forward and examined her head with sorrowful candour it is thin ye can see the scalp shining through like shot silk you look like an old man with a bald head but never mind think of the saving in the morning it will be so easy to do your hair there was a burst of laughter from brothers and sisters while sylvia covered her face with her hands and rocked to and fro in mock despair you need never be unduly elated by a compliment from pixie miss trevor said geoffrey hilliard meaningly she is the most transparently truthful person i ever encountered and favoured me with several character sketches of my wife before we were engaged which might have warned me of my fate if i'd been a sensible fellow i have remembered them pixie many a time since then and i'm glad to find your foreign experiences have not affected your candour there's another thing that is not much altered so far as i can hear and that's your brogue my dear it sounds to me almost as pronounced as in the old days when you were running wild at knock but it's got a french accent to it now that's better than english cried pixie eagerly i was learning to speak quite elegantly in surbiton but therese wouldn't listen to a word of english out of my mouth and if you'll believe me me dears my very dreams are in french the last few months there was jeune Phil in paris who used to promenade with us sometimes for the benefit of hearing me talk english she said the words didn't sound the same way as when they taught them to her at school hell les miserables the brogue of her put shame on me own before i came away the shoulders went up again and a roguish smile lit up the little face bridgie watched it with rapt adoring eyes her pixie her baby was now a big girl almost grown up transformed from the forlorn-looking elf to a natty little personage more like the pictures of jeune fille on the back of french pattern plates than she could have believed possible for irish flesh and blood imitative pixie had caught the air and the good therese had evidently taken immense pains with the costume in which her pupil should make her reappearance in the family circle bridgie gazed at the buckled high-heeled shoes peeping from beneath the flounces and wondered if it could really be that they held the same little feet which used to patter about buttonless and down at heel she looked at the jaunty outstanding bow which tied back the hair and contrasted it with the wisp of ribbon twisted to the proportions of a tape and knotted like a cat o nine tails which used to bind together the straggly locks and as she looked she felt shall it be confessed a pang of longing and regret for the days that were no more it passed in a moment for whatever her external appearance might be pixie was transparently the same at heart and quick to note the faintest shadow on the face of the dear mother's sister she swung round to face bridgie the grey eyes bent upon her in earnest scrutiny they saw something written there that had not been visible two years before the outward marks of an inward and very bitter struggle and bridgie flushed beneath the scrutiny of that clear-seeing childlike gaze and trembled at the thought of what was to come has any one been unkind to you bridgie asked pixie in deep full-throated tones she put up her hand and stroked the soft cheek with a tenderness of pitying love which was more eloquent than words there are dips in your cheeks like miss minutes when she was getting over the fever and your eyes look tired what has happened to worry ye me dear and take the colour out of your face she has enough colour to satisfy you at the moment hasn't she jack said laughing and pixie nodded with ruthless candour because she's blushing what are you blushing for you silly girl it isn't as if i had asked about a heart affair the girls in france were always talking of heart affairs and asking if you were fiance they thought you were very old and must be going to quaff st catherine that means that you are going to be an old maid i said yes of course you were because you were needed at home esmeralda was no use but we could not get on without bridgie 
you miserable ungrateful child this is my reward for all i have done for you declaimed esmeralda with dramatic emphasis but bridgie's face lit up with a smile of whole-hearted satisfaction thank god whatever her personal disappointment might be she could never feel that she was alone in the world that among all its teeming millions there was no human being whose happiness depended upon her presence she had been spared that worst trial to a woman's heart and pixie's calm taking for granted that she was indispensable to the family circle was the greatest comfort which she could have given no i shan't leave you darling i have too much to do looking after you and those three big boys and when you fly away to nests of your own sylvia and i have all sorts of plans for enjoying ourselves together i have promised faithfully to wheel her about in her bath chair and i will make your caps i'm clever at millinery said sylvia pretending not to hear jack's murmurs of protest and looking very pretty and animated as she sat erect in her chair and gesticulated with her thin little hands you shall have one with pearl dangles for high days and holidays and nice stiff little black bows for ordinary wear we will knit socks and mittens and play cribbage in the evening and talk over the days of our youth it's almost a pity we know each other now for we shan't be able to romance as much as we would like perhaps the romance will come in some other way perhaps a husband may interfere with the claims of st catherine said geoffrey putting into words the language of jack's eyes and everybody stared at sylvia's face with embarrassing curiosity i shall never marry she said obstinately not that she meant it in the least for she did not but she was one of the girls who foolishly think it the right thing to protest in public and who are mistaken enough to feel a trifle ashamed of the natural womanly longing for some one to love and to protect them which god himself has put in their hearts a few girls there may be who honestly mean such a decision but they are very few indeed while their hearers are invariably sceptical not one of the o'shaughnessys seemed in the least impressed by sylvia's disclaimer and it was disconcerting to hear pixie's sympathetic did no one ever ask ye never mind they may still you are not so very old sylvia made up her mind there and then that it was better to say exactly what one meant in the presence of miss pixie o'shaughnessy End of chapter 10「Eleven of More About Pixie by Mrs. George D. Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Esmeralda Checkmated. Three days after Christmas, Esmeralda and her husband returned to Ireland, scattering invitations, severally and in bulk, to all the inhabitants of Number Three Rutland Road. Even Sylvia found herself invited for a long visit and was the more surprised at this mark of favour because mrs hilliard's demeanour towards her was tinged with jealousy and uneasy suspicion she was willing enough to play lady bountiful present offerings of fruit and flowers and be gushingly sympathetic but she liked to monopolise the whole attention of her sisters and was not well pleased when they in their turn hung about the invalid's couch she had not been an hour in the same room moreover before she had intercepted one of jack's most melting glances and the stare of the great grey eyes left no doubt as to the disapproval with which she viewed the flirtation sylvia's annoyance converted her into a very hedgehog of dignity and the prickly quills kept the young fellow at such a distance that he lost faith in his own fascinations for the first and only time in his career he bade esmeralda an affectionate farewell but was in truth well resigned to her departure a fact which she was quite sharp enough to discover 
jack is pleased that i am going away she said to bridgie as the two sisters sat together for the last confidential chat he knows that i watch him flirting with sylvia trevor and thinks he will get on better without me you really ought to be careful bridgie and not let them be too much together does he flirt with her not more than he does with every other girl said bridgie leniently i don't see why i should worry myself about it sylvia is a sensible girl who is not given to fancying that every man is in love with her and jack is just a dear soft-hearted boy who can't help making pretty speeches but he would never make serious love if he did not mean it and if he did well why not sylvia as well as any one else but mrs jeffrey hilliard was not to be so easily appeased she threw back her haughty head lowered languid eyelids and drawled out my dear bridgie remember whom you are speaking about jack is the head of the family he's o'shaughnessy of knock eventually as we hope and believe he will go back to take up his own position and thanks to jeff the property will be in a very different condition from what it was when he left he must make a marriage which will be a help not a hindrance and who is she answer me that what do you know about her she is a dear girl she's very attractive her father is abroad she lives with an old aunt exactly a pleasant girl in a london suburb esmeralda's voice was full of ineffable condescension there are thousands of them and no doubt they are charming in their way but not for jack he owes a duty to the family as well as himself and you ought to tell him as much you really ought bridgie speak to him at once before it goes too far suppose you speak to him yourself when you are so hot upon it it's a pity to leave it to me no i'd rather not jack is so stupid about taking advice he would snap my nose off if i said anything i really don't see why my nose is not as valuable as yours why should i do your disagreeable work for you retorted bridgie with spirit you did not know that geoffrey was a rich man when you promised to marry him and it's the last thing i would think of myself so why should we expect any more of jack i am not going to interfere whatever happens and if you take my advice you won't mention sylvia's name to him i don't intend to but esmeralda shut her lips tightly over an unspoken determination there are more ways than one of nipping in the bud an incipient love affair but she did not care about confiding her latest inspiration to any hearer least of all bridgie who would have given up her most cherished plans rather than hurt the feelings of a fellow-creature she changed the subject and talked lightly on impersonal topics until the moment of parting drew near when there came a sudden softening over the beautiful face and she said in gentle diffident tones i didn't like to ask before but i can't leave without knowing darling have you heard bridgie shook her head mutely and the lines which pixie had noticed deepened round her eyes and mouth but the eyes smiled still a brave steady smile i never shall hear now joan i've made up my mind to that i don't know how you bear it i can't think how you manage to be so composed and cheerful if jeff had treated me like that it would have soured me for life you were never sour from the first and and now you seem quite happy yet as pixie says you have a pathetic look which shows that you have not really forgotten you still care bridgie dear i shall always care said bridgie quietly there's an ache at the back of my heart but there are so many things at the front that it gets crowded out besides you know esmeralda darling i don't want to seem to praise myself but it's a trouble which god has sent me and i ask him every night to help me bear it in the right way 
it wouldn't be the right way to let the shadow of it darken other lives besides my own if i moped and grizzled every one in the house would be uncomfortable and they have their own worries poor creatures without suffering for mine i made an excellent rule for my own benefit to laugh downstairs and cry in my own room and it answers beautifully for i'm so tired when i get to bed then i've no sooner begun repining than i wake up and find it's morning you try it dear when you've got a worry you'll find it splendid esmeralda shook her head not for me what i feel i must show and sooner than i feel it if that is possible if i tried to bottle up my feelings it would make me ill and the explosion would be all the greater when it did come my only chance is to get over it as soon as possible but in your case it is a long slow suspense which is worse than any definite trouble you are an angel dear to bear it as you do it's mysterious that it should have come to you and not me for you don't need discipline and i who was always the naughty one have got all that i want geoffrey and home and the dear little boy you must come soon bridgie to see the boy he will be getting teeth and all sorts of luxuries and his godmother ought to be there to look after him esmeralda rose and strolled over to the glass to arrange her hat and pin on a filmy veil i must go downstairs now and say good-bye to miss trevor don't hurry dear if you have anything to do we won't leave for a quarter of an hour still unsuspecting bridgie trotted away to the kitchen to give some orders while esmeralda sailed into the drawing-room all smiles and amiability a peal of laughter greeted her ears as she entered and there sat pixie perched on the end of the sofa with her hands clasped round her knees and her chin poked forward enjoying to the full the discovery of a new audience who was apparently as much interested in the sayings and doings of the o'shaughnessy family as she was herself both girls looked up as the rustle of silks heralded mrs hilliard's approach but while the younger remained serenely composed sylvia's lips tightened and her eyes gave out an ominous flash it was as if she felt an antagonistic spirit in the air and braced herself for the conflict yet nothing could have been more friendly than esmeralda's smile more cordial than her voice i told bridgie i must really have ten minutes for a farewell chat with you before i go it has been so pleasant to have you here and i hope we shall soon meet again has pixie been amusing you while we were upstairs come down from that couch child you must be quite cramped i am here so you need not mount guard any longer i'm very comfortable where i am said pixie easily she laid her head on one side and stared at her sister with large innocent eyes which seemed strangely disconcerting to that young lady's composure she frowned and snapped a bracelet together with quite a vicious snap but you are too old for such inelegant positions you are almost grown up now and must learn how to behave for goodness sake get up before jeff sees you he is so very particular about nice behaviour in girls "'Twas a bad relapse for him when he married you,' muttered Pixie beneath her breath. She straightened herself slowly and let her feet slip to the ground, but Esmeralda realized that nothing but a direct request would convince her of the extraordinary fact that her absence was for once more desired than her presence. For obvious reasons such a request could not be made, and as the time was quickly passing nothing remained but to clothe her hints even more circumspectly than she had intended i am so glad that your foot is really getting better she said graciously to sylvia bridgie says the nurse is so pleased with its progress the last few days you will be able to walk about soon and then if you feel inclined for a change we shall be so pleased if you will come over to visit us it is quiet at knock but i would drive you about and the air is so delightful that i am sure it would do you good you will hear all about the place from pixie so that it would not feel strange to you when you arrived and we have a few nice friends within driving distance she would like molly burrell wouldn't she pixie 
that's a young girl who lives seven miles from us at knock but we think nothing of that distance in the country she was always over at the castle before jack went away and we used to say she felt like another sister you remember how he used to drive over in the cart and bring her back to surprise us i do so and the afternoon when she went shopping into the post office as they drove through the village and tim hegan came up and began bidding for the old grey mare and with that jack took him into the cart and drove over to the farm and never thought of poor molly until the evening when she cut him dead limping home through the mud twas a cruel thing to do and the poor creature putting on new boots for the occasion to do him honour says jack i've done four myself this time it would take a cleverer man than myself to twist that into a compliment oh that's an old world story cried esmeralda with her head in the air her cheeks had flushed despite her efforts for composure and she was uncomfortably conscious that sylvia was trying to restrain a smile at this most open contradiction of the implied attachment between jack and his irish neighbour her irritation urged her to stronger measures and she said testily it proves how little dependence can be placed upon jack's promises if he could forget molly it is no wonder that he changes his mind every other day but they made up that quarrel ages ago and he was over there shooting in september and squiring her all over the county you should not tell tales out of school pixie was it me i thought it was yourself you began saying that they were such friends and i thought maybe it would amuse sylvia to hear so it does pixie it amuses me extremely assented sylvia with an intentional emphasis which made esmeralda wince once more for however innocent the little sister might be she felt convinced that sylvia trevor thoroughly understood her implied warning and was by no means docile in her manner of receiving it she sat up stiff and erect smiling into space with an expression of scornful superiority which filled the beholder with unwilling admiration in just such a spirit would she herself have accepted interference from the lips of a stranger she recognized a kindred spirit and realized that putting jack out of the question miss sylvia trevor would be a friend after her own heart the repeated invitation had in it a note of sincerity which had been wanting in the earlier rendering but sylvia only murmured thank you in a politely non-committal manner and shrank back so decidedly from the proffered kiss that there was no choice but to substitute a formal handshake in its stead the sisters drove off together to the station and sylvia was left alone to relieve pent-up irritation by making one impetuous resolve after another to replace each the following moment by one diametrically different thank goodness she has gone at last i can't think how i ever could have liked her i think i dislike her more than any one i ever met how dare she interfere with me how dare she imply that i want to monopolize her precious brother i shall never speak to him again as long as i live i shall go home to-morrow and take good care that i never come across when he is likely to be at home perhaps she has warned him too as if he were not conceited enough already he is worth a dozen of her all the same and is far nicer than i thought at first it's perfectly absurd to think a man and a girl cannot be in the same house for a week without falling in love with each other i won't condescend to take the faintest notice of her insinuations i shall be as nice as i like and give up snubbing him from this minute he can be engaged to fifty molly burrells if he likes that's no reason why i should not treat him civilly in the hours which elapsed before the return of the sisters she had had time to change her mind a dozen times over to write letters to aunt margaret and burn them in the fire to invent scathing sarcasms by which poor jack was to be reduced to a condition of hopeless subjection and rehearse melting scenes when her womanly sympathy would soothe ruffled spirits and restore him to calm 
all uncertainty as to her conduct was however removed by the first glance at jack's face when he returned home in the evening for it bore the unmistakable marks of real anxiety and the weary sigh with which he sank into his chair was something new to his vigorous manhood bridgie bustled in with the tea which always awaited his coming kissed him lightly and hurried away to finish some letters pixie sat hunched up before the fire devouring a book and jack pushed his chair nearer sylvia's couch staring at her in a dumb melancholy fashion which had in it something singularly beguiling despite his great height and muscular form he looked so helpless and appealing like a nice child who has lost a toy or a big collie dog which turns pathetic eyes towards his master's face sylvia smiled involuntarily but it was a very friendly smile and her voice had lost its mocking tone as she inquired well what's the trouble jack put his cup on the table and leant towards her his elbows resting on his knees his chin supported on clasped hands pixie read on undisturbed soft gurgles of laughter marking her enjoyment of sensational passages i've had a blow said jack ghastly disappointment this is the day when the firm announces the various arrangements for the year increases in salary and so on i quite understood that i should come in for a substantial rise if not a junior partnership it was talked about when i joined four years back and as nothing was done last january i made a certainty of it coming off now instead of that i get nothing nothing no advance at all upon the payment of the last two years i had it out with the partners this afternoon and they seemed to think i had done unusually well they implied that it was a piece of pure imagination on my part to have expected to be taken into the firm but i know nothing about business except what i've read but is it not usual to have something written a definite agreement which settles things without the possibility of argument if you joined this firm with the idea of being made a partner was not an agreement written down in black and white jack waved his hand in airy dissent no there was nothing definite but we talked it over the old fellow certainly held out hopes for the future i made so sure of a partnership that we took this house in the prospect of being able to pay for it out of my increased earnings it's too expensive as it is for people brought up as we have been i'm the most practical of the bundle and with care and attention can make half a crown go almost as far as an englishman's shilling but bridgie bless her wears herself out saving pennies and throws away pounds with the best in my father's time there was never any money to trouble about so she got into the way of ordering things without thinking what they would cost and it's a difficult plan to forsake she's done her best poor creature i wouldn't blame her for the world and and will you have to leave the house sylvia's heart sank drearily at the prospect what if the o'shaughnessys flitted away to a suburb at the opposite end of the city and number three rutland road was deserted once more or tenanted by an ordinary commonplace family such as inhabited every other villa in the neighbourhood after the sweet friendship of bridgie the fascinations of jack the audacities of the two boys the witcheries of pixie and last but not least the incursions of esmeralda exasperating but to the last degree romantic and beautiful sylvia felt a shudder of distaste at the thought of a stout mamma and papa one baby in a perambulator another in a mail cart and a graduated line of schoolboys and girls sallying forth daily to their appointed tasks oh, i'm so sorry you will have to leave she sighed and jack smiled at her in grateful acknowledgment of her regret i'm glad you are sorry but i don't intend to leave we've been here only four months and i can't face another removal for many reasons we will have to squeeze along somehow until things look up a crop of bills have come in during the last few days to make matters worse and i will have to talk things over with bridgie to-night i hate to worry her but there must be some system or we shall find ourselves in the workhouse some fine day 
and now there is the child to think of she will be an extra expense sylvia glanced quickly across the room at the figure in the depths of the armchair she sat motionless her head bent over her book but pixie was one of those intensely alive little creatures who seemed to infect their very surroundings with vitality it seemed to sylvia that the pages fluttered in agitated fashion the bow of ribbon holding back her hair seemed of a sudden to stand out at attention the knotted ends looked like two alert curious ears at the back of her head how much had pixie heard End of chapter 11